everything I do gonna be funky from now on. Everything I do gonna be funky from now on. Everything I do is gonna be funky from now on. I get to go. From now on, yeah, everything I do gonna be funky. From now on, everything I do gonna be funky. From everything I do is gonna be funky. From now on, yeah, everything I do, everything I do, everything I do, everything I do is gonna be funky. From now on, it's gonna be funky. From now on. Good morning everyone, it's the 5th of October, just after 7am and as you'll have seen the sun's just rising and I'm on the Clive River and it's about half tide, a little less than half tide on the increase supposed to be high at about quarter to lunchtime. First paddle of the season. It's been a major bit of an issue getting back on the water in Hawke's Bay after Cyclone Gabriel. Some of the waterways here are still closed because of silt damage. They were closed for quite a while after the cyclone because there were still a lot of bodies missing and they suspected a lot of them would have been washed down the rivers. The police weren't very clear about the numbers and everything and it's suspected that there's still actually quite a few people missing. I intended to shoot this video last week actually, went out to Lake Tutera and that lake is closed off because of damage from the cyclone. So that's one of my most favourite paddling spots in Hawke's Bay, maybe out of action for the summer. It's just early spring here at the moment. I 
think it's about nine degrees this morning. It's supposed to reach a high of about 24 today. And it's supposed to be fine, no wind. So it should be a nice day. So I've had a busy couple of weeks because the site that I work for is moving from a small facility to a huge multi-million dollar fa facility and we're working through the whole thing of all the logistics of getting everybody over to the new location starting up the new kitchen figuring out the food service routine all that kind of stuff so yeah this is the first opportunity really this season that I've had to get out for a paddle and by fluke I ended up with three days off this week so this is day two good time for a paddle you're watching podcast number 54 I think that's right and the title of this podcast is going to be The Marrow. And that is because we're now going to start getting serious and discuss how to decipher a serious and somewhat cryptic classic alchemical texts from the acetate path tradition and I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff that most of you probably will have not heard anywhere else about the nature of these texts and how they are deciphered so this is going to be a podcast series a new series on George Ripley's Medulla Alchemiae, the marrow of alchemy. And in each podcast I'm going to break down just a few passages from that text until we've covered the bulk of the subject matter. And I've given enough indication of how to work with a text like that. And with any luck, there's going to be a few nice surprises. Those guys come down here almost every day. They have a net down by the first bridge and they come down to check it for Kahawai and Grey Mullet. So there are four sets of bridges just here. This is the confluence of the Clive River, the Nara Roro and the Tutaikuri. They all actually meet right here. And there are four lots of bridges here right at this part. There's actually six all together. But the other, the Clive ones are further, further down. And during the cyclone, this bridge here was left pretty intact 
but the bridge which is the next one along, two bridges which are the next ones along the road bridge which is closest to us now stayed intact but the train bridge, the rail bridge was completely wiped out by uh, what they call slash which is the timber that's left over after logging when they chopped all the branches off the main trunks they just leave the branches there and then when there are big storms those branches get washed down into the rivers and then they all bunch up into big rafts and when they hit a bridge they just bowl the bridge over from the pressure of the water behind them So this road has been is open again and the rail bridge just got opened uh, last week I think so it's taken them that long to completely rebuild as a temporary structure the rail bridge. Okay, so let's talk about Ripley's Medulla Alchemia. The first thing we should consider is that Sir George Ripley, he's sometimes called. I'm not sure whether he was actually ever knighted though, he's actually a cleric in the Catholic Church. Canon of uh, Bridlington. And the reason why he is of interest to people studying alchemy is that he's considered the first person in British history, in England specifically, to have given sort of a rebirth to the interest and study of alchemy and particularly an interest in the famous alchemist Ramon Lull or Raymond Lully as he's known in the anglicized version of his name. So Ripley studied Lully's work and considered his work to be one of the most authoritative sources on the subject of what we now call the acetate path. So in the Western alchemical tradition, Raymond Lully is considered the father of the modern alchemical tradition. And because he, he was seen as being the father of the tradition, that's one of the reasons why Raymond Lully ended up in studying his works and mastering his process. Because he is considered a master alchemist, George Ripley, that he did produce the stone and perform transmutation which qualifies him as a master of alchemy of the laboratory tradition. Uh, Lully was alive in the latter half of the 1400s and he wrote the medulla in about around 1476 it was finished anyway and he and he dedicated the marrow of alchemy to the archbishop of york and york is a very important center in england 
was a very important part of the Christian tradition in England also. So Ripley had written a number of books, we assume, on the subject of alchemy. He certainly had writings on the subject of alchemy before he wrote The Marrow of Alchemy. But in The Marrow of Alchemy, he points out in the introduction that everything that he had written before that book was not accurate and should be ignored. So it's helpful when considering the subject of the bibliography of Ripley's writings because there are a lot of writings attributed to him but there is an academic she's a historian by the name of Jennifer Rampling who is a bit of an expert in Ripley her interest is in the history of chemistry particularly the early history of alchemy in the Western tradition and because of that she has a big interest in Ripley because he played a major role <coughs> in the beginning of Al <coughs> he played a major role in the beginning of alchemy in um, Europe in general but specifically in England Britain and Jennifer Rampling says that there's really only one book that we can say without much doubt that it was definitely written by Ripley and can be firmly attributed to him and that is the medulla and the reason that she says that is that in the introduction to the medulla Ripley says that he wrote the book he tells us what year he sent the book back to England for the Archbishop of York which is 1476 and then he says everything that I wrote before this was not accurate and should be ignored and so therefore he's kind of telling us that now he knows the truth about alchemy he's written the medulla in order to describe that truth um, a number of authors have called books that they have written the medulla or marrow of alchemy and what this means is that the information in the book is supposed to describe the core concepts of alchemy the important ideas and concepts about alchemy the very marrow of the subject and so that's what Ripley is telling us about this book that he has written so this is why when we take consideration that Ripley's understanding of the nature of the acetate path is an important understanding and he describes it very well especially in his bosom book which is something I'm going to talk about later on in detail um, and therefore the one book that we can be sure to attribute to him and that he is telling us is his core knowledge of the acetate path that book therefore plays in a very important role so that's the background to the medulla the copy that I'm going to read from and quote is taken from Adam McLean's Alchemy website and if I'm right that edition was actually part of another book it was a collection of alchemical texts and so the numbering of the passages in the medulla or the chapters is uh, starts off with an advanced numbering partly because it's not the first text out of that collection of texts so 
that copy of the medulla is divided into chapters and then each chapter is divided into paragraphs which are numbered in Roman numerals. So I'm not going to begin quoting the text right from the very beginning because largely it's just him dedicating the book to the Archbishop of York and telling him when he's reading the book to consider that he, Ripley, is being very um, revealing and very clear about the detail of information that he's giving on the acetate path. And of course most alchemists say this in their books and then when we start reading them we discover that they're actually very cryptic and written in a way that's designed to make them very difficult to understand. So that's one of the reasons why I have chosen this book to discuss in this first series on more serious lab work discussion because it's a it's not hugely cryptic but it's cryptic enough that I believe that it's a good model of the kind of cryptic writing cryptic alchemical literature that we might consider to be typical of the era in which Ripley was writing. A lot of people read these texts, they have no idea really how to understand them, but they make the first mistake of thinking that the way that Frater Albertus, the modern alchemist Frater Albertus, taught and discussed alchemy is like the benchmark for trying to understand these old texts, these cryptic old texts. And the fact is, that's actually not true. And most people who attempt to understand these cryptic old texts using Frater Albertus's alchemical worldview, his terminology and definitions, still find that they can't figure out what on earth is being discussed. But very few people realize that the reason why that's not working is because Albertus had things wrong. And we can see this in the very first passage which I'm going to quote from the medulla. We launch straight into a traditional use of alchemical terminology which is completely different than that which Frater Albertus taught. So I've just pulled over because I'm definitely fighting the current of the river now plus a headwind wasn't making any headway at all um, and, it, and sitting up here on the bank is just going to make it a bit easier for me to read and quote the text so I think the section that I'm going to start quoting from is chapter 50 LXI chapter 51 or something let's have a look yeah in Roman numerals LXI um, and it's titled the preface of the Archbishop of York and we're gonna go down to paragraph number nine I, X in Roman numerals. Actually, I'll read 
paragraph number eight first. I require not of you, and he's talking here to the Archbishop of York, for this secret a great sum of gold or silver. Nor do I put this secret in writing for you to bestow much cost and expenses upon it. Nor do I for myself desire any reward these things agree not with the physic verity. In other words, it's not acceptable to sell the secrets of alchemy, which professes that its works are not chargeable and expensive. <coughs> In other words, the true work for the Philosopher's Stone is not an expensive process. Marinus saith, Beware that you spend nothing in this majesty of gold. And Dustin saith, with, value, with the value of one noble, which is a gold coin, is the whole majesty performed. So this is something to keep in mind, that in an ideal situation, and by ideal I mean if you actually know the whole process, um, you're not still trying to guess what to do and when to do it. If you actually know the whole process and know what you're doing, then the process is not long and it's not expensive. Okay, so paragraph number nine begins like this. Since then it is so, in what thing is our gold to be found? So when he asks this question, he's not talking about common gold that you dig out of the earth. He's talking about our gold. In other words, where can we find the gold of the alchemists? Which is a different substance altogether and we know today through our knowledge of chemistry and physics that what he is calling our gold pretty much has no relationship at all to chemical gold then he says is it not in mercury, which is called quick or living gold? Now that's not a very common term for the metal mercury, that silvery, watery, running liquid type metal that we know as mercury that used to be in thermometers. So he's not referring to that kind of mercury. He's not referring to metallic mercury because he's calling it living or quick gold. Is, not, is it not in mercury, which is called quick or living gold? So he's uh, referring there to what alchemists call the principle of mercury and there are three principles mercury sulfur and salt so he's saying is not our gold in the principle of mercury which is called quick or living gold so one of the things that he's now telling us about the philosophic principle of mercury is that one of its titles is living gold or quick gold and that by this he's re, re, he is uh, suggesting to us that the philosophic principle of mercury is the root of gold or the seed of gold or living gold not dead gold that you pull out of a mine and smelt into the yellow metal. So 
our living gold is found in the principle of mercury. Raymundus saith, in other words, now he's quoting Raymond Lulling, he that will reduce quick gold into thin water must make it, do it, and work it by its contrary. So now uh, Ripley is telling us that Raymond Lully is instructing the student of alchemy to reduce quick gold into thin water. So the quick gold that he's talking about is a solid substance or a near solid substance. And he's saying that that solid substance needs to be converted into a thin water. And by that, he means uh, a volatile liquid or a substance which looks like water. It's transparent and it's liquid and it is uh, runny or very liquid. So if you, if you want to find our living gold Raymond Lully says reduce quick gold into a thin water must make it do it and work it by its contrary in other words we take the solid form of mercury and to turn it into a thin water we have to uh, manipulate that solid by its contrary in other words, fire or sulfur. By heating that solid, we can convert it into a thin water or transparent liquid. And he calls it its contrary because uh, that thin water is a, a liquid, a water and therefore its contrary would be a fire. And because it's called mercury, its contrary is sulfur. Mercury and sulfur are a binary pair, and sulfur is the principle of fire. For saith he, in other words, for Ripley says, quick or living gold has in itself four natures and four humors or elements. So this gives away now what this quick gold or mercury actually is. It is the acetate of a metal. And the, the acetates of metals, particularly the acetate of lead, is what the old alchemists referred to as our chaos or our prima materia, our first matter. And we know that the chaos or the prima materia contains four elements. And anybody who has studied the acetate path and has performed pyrolytic distillation, which converts the solid acetate into a thin water or liquid, knows that that thin water or liquid contains four substances, which the old alchemists refer to as the four elements, and which Raymond Lully also calls the four humors or four natures. So now we know what this mercury is. It's sericon or lead acetate. And therefore saith he, and therefore saith Raymond Lully, if you putrefy its cold with its hot and its dry with its moist, you shall not only have the humidity of all bodies, but you shall have a menstruum which will dissolve argent vive, in other words, quicksilver, 
or living silver forever. For the least part of mercury being once dissolved, the dissolved mercury will always dissolve mercury ad infinitum. It's a bit of a cryptic statement there, and at the moment we don't need to understand what that is. All we need to understand in that first passage, paragraph number nine, is that Ripley and Raymond Lully refer to the acetate lead as mercury. The acetate of lead as mercury. And this, for anybody who understands Frater Albertus's system, when he talks about the three principles, mercury, sulfur and salt, Frater Albertus says that mercury is always a clear liquid, a volatile liquid, and often a flammable volatile liquid. So once we pyrolytically distill or dry distill lead acetate, we obtain a thin water, convert a solid into a liquid by fire, by heat or destructive distillation as it's sometimes called. And in that first passage Ripley makes the point that we don't just call the thin water mercury but he also uses the term mercury for the solid substance that the great work begins with which is lead acetate that is the philosophical or metaphorical beginning of the great work because it's the first matter the prima materia or the chaos the alchemist chaos which, from which we extract our four elements so we are all ready with that first paragraph using the term mercury in reference to one of the principles one of the three principles we're already using it in a way that Frater Albertus would not use it and in a way that contradicts Frater Albertus's teachings and this tells us that we will only confuse ourselves if we keep trying to decipher texts using Frater Albertus's definitions. Paragraph number 10. Mercury may as well be called quick gold. In other words, that first solid substance that we take in hand to convert into a thin liquid through pyrolytic distillation he's saying that that is called mercury and that we may as well call it quick gold or living gold we may as well be called quick gold as quicksilver because some people use the term quicks or living silver for that uh, philosophic principle as well for it contains them both. So when we pyrolytically distill lead acetate, that first solid substance, the prima materia, and we gain a thin liquid, he's saying to us that that thin liquid contains both quick gold and quicksilver. Another relatively common name for those two substances which we can see in that distilled pyrolytically distilled substance is red mercury and white mercury and he's calling them quick gold and quick silver for it contains them both if air will make this separation we must put there to divers contrary things as Roger Bacon saith in speculo 
but this putrefaction cannot be done till it is dissolved in water white as milk so he's here telling us that we can separate the quick gold from the quick silver but first that substance has to be putrefied or digested in a water which is white as milk and this is what uh, the alchemists call black virginius or the milk of the virgin the virgin's milk and there's a bit of a trick in that comment because when we pyrolytically distill lead acetate one of the first early things that comes over is a milky looking white substance which is actually water with acetone in it and sublimated salts of lead and those volatile or sublimated salts of lead mix with the clear liquid the water and the acetone and form a milky looking substance which they call the virgin's milk and he's saying that the quicksilver and quick gold must be digested in that milky substance and he's deliberately being confusing here because those substances are all part of the liquid that comes over the still head during pyrolytic distillation and he's basically saying that entire liquid that comes over in the distillation should be digested or putrefied putrefy that milk 15 days in balneum marie in a water bath then separate its element and cleanse its earth in other words take that water and digest it for 15 days in a water bath in other words at a very low temperature and then distill that thin water which will separate its elements and there will be left behind a solid a salt which will be black he doesn't say that but he said that that earth needs to be cleansed and he's calling it earth with a capital E because it is actually the element of earth and then after that join it again in equal weight then is the elixir made complete for Saturn and Jupiter so he's saying that after that earth has been purified add back to it the other three elements in equal weight and then is the elixir made for Saturn and Jupiter in other words it's a quintessence when those four elements are bound together again and this is the process that we use for lead and tin or Saturn and Jupiter quick gold is crude in other words it's the source or root of metallic gold this is what they believed that lead acetate or the chaos or the prima materia was the source and root of metallic gold that's in the earth and he's saying it's a crude form of gold in other words it's not pure quick gold is crude imperfect and unfixed in every degree in other words it can be dry distilled or destructively distilled or pyrolytically distilled um, because it's volatile it's not fixed in any degree and yet it is accounted a body so even though it's not fixed it's not a fixed solid it's still referred to as a body quick gold is a solid substance or a body or the prima materia 
Again, this is not what Frater Alberta teaches about Mercury. So the alchemists of Ripley's tradition, in their code language that they use, they use the word Mercury almost for all of the substances in each step of the work. Although there be no fixation in it, and therefore it may be much sooner brought to its first matter. In other words, it may, may be easily distilled than any other of the bodies that have any part of fixation in them. In other words, lead and tin, Saturn and Jupiter, may most easily be reduced to their first matter or their acetate than any of the other metals. For they must have much labour, the other metals, and long time to separate them and bring them back to their first matter. So he's telling us here why we use lead or tin uh, as the first substance of the stone or to make the prima materia from because they are most easily reduced to their first matter or they're most easily made into a lead acetate and then most easily pyrolytically distilled. The other metals take a huge effort and that's why uh, most alchemists don't use the other metals. Chapter 11 For, saith Lully, the elements of mercury, in other words the four elements which are contained in lead acetate, may be dissolved, and by that we mean pyrolytically distilled and reduced from a solid into a liquid, and being so dissolved they may be separated so once they become once the metallic acetate becomes a liquid through pyrolysis we can then separate the four elements we can't separate the four elements when the lead acetate is still a solid there be some that think our resoluble seed which is, now he's referring to lead acetate again, and he's calling it a resoluble seed. In other words, it's a seed of gold, and it can be re-dissolved or reduced to a liquid. Or dissolved menstruum, in other words, that liquid, the thin water that is the product of pyrolysis is a menstruum and it's the lead acetate or quick gold dissolved. They call the distillation of lead acetate, converting it from a solid to a liquid, as a dissolution. Or dissolved menstruum is the water of argent vive, and argent vive is Latin for living silver. In other words, it's the water of mercury. And so he's calling lead acetate mercury again, and that the liquid that comes out of the uh, pyrolytic distillation, the thin water, is the water of mercury, made only by itself because it does dissolve both metals and precious stones which we call pearls, and so it is. And he's being a bit uh, vague there, and he's abridging that comment and saying that that dissolved lead acetate that converts itself into a water can dissolve other metals and uh, pearl, but not in its raw state as the freshly distilled um, acetone, water, the oil and the salt of the thin water. Those things in their raw state straight after pyrolysis will not dissolve other metals and pearl. They first have to be prepared in a special way. And so it is now how this dissolving menstruum is made. 
not only Raymond sees, seems to show, but Roger Bacon, in like manner, in his speculum Alchemia, where he saith, put the body which is most weighty, in other words, a heavy solid, lead, it's not hard to figure out, into a distillery or distillery. Put lead acetate into a still and draw forth thereof its sweet rose or dew with a little wind or breath. That's his very uh, artistical way of describing pyrolytic distillation. He calls the conversion of the solid lead acetate into the liquid distillate, he calls it the sweet rose or dew with a little wind or breath. He's kind of explaining to us that these terms have been used as ciphers in the past for that freshly distilled acetone and water and so on of that pyrolytic distillation. For betwixt every drop of water comes forth a breath, and by breath he means like smoke, because uh, there's liquid water, chemical water that comes over, plus a fume or white smoke, which he calls breath, as it were of a man. In other words, he's saying that the white fume that we see in the pyrolytic distillation of lead acetate is like on a cold morning when you breathe out and you see that white uh, breath of warm air condensing in the cold air outside, warm air from the lungs condensing. He, so he says it looks like the breath of a man which is the substance of argent vive, quicksilver, and which the philosophers call our mercury which, if it be well putrefied beforehand, will then yield more and issue out forcibly as it were wildfire out of a trunk, especially when the red fume comes. Thus have you one of our argent vives, or living mercuries. So he's saying there that if you take the lead acetate and first digest it or putrefy it before you perform pyrolytic distillation you will end up with more product the white fume and the red fume or red oil that come over in that pyrolytic distillation will be will come over more quickly and in greater volume if you digest the lead acetate first and he's quoting Roger Bacon there I think So, one more paragraph for this video. Paragraph 12. To the same thing, Raymundus assents. In other words, Raymond agrees with Roger Bacon about that. Where he saith, Then have you that argent vive, which is called ours with a capital O and so it is indeed one of our argent vive in other words it's the mercury of the philosophers not metallic mercury although the intent of the same philosopher in Libro Anime Artis Transmutionary chapter 2 is touching Another more noble and more excellent water, supposed by some to be our burning water, drawn out of the gum of vitriol. So what he's saying here is that there is a similarity between the process of pyrolytically distilling lead acetate and the process of pyrolytically distilling uh, vitriol gum of vitriol uh, which is the way that you make um, sulfuric acid he's saying there is a uh, 
and a logical relationship between the two processes. They look similar. So some alchemists in the past tricked people by explaining the process for distilling sulfuric acid and told us that that was the secret. That is the process for making the Philosopher's Stone. But here, Ripley is hinting that that is not the philosophic process, but it's very similar. And they have an analogical relationship. And he calls that sulfuric acid burning water. By virtue of which most noble and excellent attractive water, water he doth not only often dissolve the body of gold, not as he doth it with the aforesaid argent feed commonly dissolved. So in other words, with philosophic mercury, our mercury, you can dissolve gold, but only when it's prepared properly, not with sulfuric acid. But also the same solar body, in other words gold, by force of that attractive virtue, we know he's talking about our mercury because he's calling it an attractive solvent. It's one of the um, cipher names for philosophic mercury is our mercury or our water attractive. Disposed in a more noble manner, as I myself have seen done, no only in the metalline elixir, but also in the elixir of life, is hereafter shall be declared. So if you're just following along with that, the passages I've quoted and explained, without reference to the original text, it all might sound a little bit confusing, so it's helpful to replay that and read along the original text with what I'm saying and you'll be able to tell the bits that I'm quoting and which bits are commentary on the original quoted text. So I think that was three paragraphs and that's probably enough for this video while we're getting started on this series and that allows us then to explain what the important message is here in the in the opening passages of uh, Ripley's explanation in his medulla. He's telling us what the starting substance is metaphorically because the actual work begins in preparing lead by calcination. We have to take lead metal or another form of lead and we have to convert it into lead oxide. Those are actually the first steps of the work. But the old alchemists, in order to be a little bit confusing, while not lying because they're talking metaphorically, they begin often describing the great work by first discussing lead acetate, which he calls in these opening paragraphs living gold, living silver, but more particularly mercury. So he uses the term mercury for the chaos of the philosophers, for the prima materia. So he uses it, the word mercury as a general all-encompassing label for the material that we are manipulating in order to create the Philosopher's Stone. That's the first message that he's opening with. And of course it helps to realise that he's not discussing the calcination of lead and then the dissolving of that lead oxide in acetic acid in order to produce lead acetate. He's missing all of that out and he's saying we begin with the chaos because in the universe, when God is creating reality, 
that's what he does. He starts with the chaos of the elements, what's called the Ur chaos or the remote chaos, the first chaos in the universe from which the four elements are extracted which are used as the building blocks for physical reality. So that's where they be, often begin explaining the story of the Philosopher's Stone. They don't actually start at the very first thing that you do, unless they are just describing a recipe. And the medulla is obviously not just describing a recipe like in a cookbook of how to make the Philosopher's Stone. In this version of the story for the stone, he's discussing the philosophy of the process and he's doing that by using lots of different terminologies that are used to describe the different parts of the uh, stone and the different processes that those parts go through. So he starts off by saying mercury is our first substance and we call it quick gold, quick silver, also argent vive, quicksilver, and that that substance must be converted from a solid, rel relatively solid, and he even says that it's not fixed, in other words it's not like a, a non-volatile metallic salt or powder, it's soft and malleable, which we know is true of lead acetate and it's called a body in other words prima materia but it's soft and malleable enough that you can distill it and it will convert from a solid into a volatile liquid what he calls a thin water so this is where we're beginning the opening salvo of the medulla and his discussion of the process of the acetate path. Know what the first substance is, then realize that it has to be converted from a solid to a liquid, and that that is done through pyrolysis. And all of that is described without actually saying it clearly, we're doing pyrolytic distillation here. Although, I think it was in the third paragraph that I just quoted, uh, they're discussing the fumes that arise and the water that comes out of the pyrolytic distillation without actually in detail saying what it is that they're doing. What they expect is that a person who's reading the medulla and is trying to get um, insight into the process by reading it, that they already have a rough grasp of what the work is and how it functions so that they can fill in the details themselves. When you're reading it, you're supposed to go, oh, I know what it is that they're talking about here. It's pyrolytic distillation. And they're not saying it openly, but it's obvious from what they are saying that that is what they're discussing. Um, so it is a philosophic text in the manner that they're trying to explain to us the different kinds of words that are being used in other texts to name and describe the processes and the substances that all revolve around pyrolytic distillation of lead acetate or possibly tin acetate. So because there's a noisy plane in the background and the tide is now coming up so much I'm going to have to jump back in the boat. I think we shall leave it there for now. And uh, pick up at paragraph 13 in the next podcast. Thank you very much for watching. Thank God it's summer almost again a busy time coming up as I said at the beginning of the video because we're moving our work site now so there's going to be a whole lot of extra hours work for me um, but 
hopefully at the end of this summer we'll be having some interesting canoe trips which I can use as the basis for continuing the other videos in this series on Ripley's Medulla. From now on, everything I do gonna be funky. From now on, everything I do is gonna be funky. From now on, I get to go. From now on, yeah. 